there's not much point in saying that to the people who are here. I'm very grateful you are here. And uh, I'd just like to introduce um, someone for me who, um, in a sense, represents the second generation of um, people who I would consider um, mentors and uh, engineers of the 20th century. Um, Tony Hunt, um, I believe, worked for uh, one of the first generations generation, who I, I identify as the first generation, um, Felix Samueli, um, who of course had a very well-known um, <coughs> and always quite small practice in London. Um, and, and of course the other was uh, Ovarup, who I believe Tony never worked for. That's correct. Um, <laughs> amongst the growing uh, group of engineers who, who didn't somehow, I mean, engin engineers from Arabs, uh, and, and there have been many great engineers from Arabs, um, uh, sometimes seem, se seem like they, uh, they do all the work in the world, but uh, it's reassuring to know that uh, I, who didn't go to Arabs either, uh, have a mentor in Tony. Um, and uh, as I say, Tony, Tony was part of what I call the second uh, generation within whom I would include uh, the late Ted Happold and uh, Peter Rice. Um, and uh, they're the sort of engineers who um, were always um, involved in the problem. And uh, I had a short chat with Tony Ellie in the bar tonight to ask him what he was going to talk about. And of course, he's going to talk about what's happening now. And uh, he's going to talk about um, the type of structures that uh, architects are considering the type of structures that architects, the, the, the sort of forms that architects are looking at and what it means structurally. Um, so I won't go on any further. Uh, I'll hand over to Tony. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, do you want to all move up to the front or do you want to stay where you are? Well, aren't you happy where you are? No. I think I can master this system here. Um, I don't know whether you, you have a title to my talk, um, because things seem to get slightly out of hand but in the arrangements for this talk, but anyway, it's, you can either call it curved structures or curvaceous structures, whichever you like. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about is the shape of structures, the shape of structures that are being produced currently. I'm talking really primarily about the UK. And um, our curved structures, and there are a number of them being produced at, at, at the moment, are they just a fashion or are they actually based on engineers' ideas of structural efficiency? I'm not sure of the answer to this, although I think that after you've seen what I'm going to show, you may be able to draw some conclusions about what I've said and what I'm talking about. Um, I, my career, I mean, it's interesting what uh, Tim said about Felix Samueli. I worked for him for seven years, and it was a very, it was a very formative time in that, that practice, and it was a very formative time for me, and it taught me an enormous amount. And actually, at that time, come to think of it, we were doing some very interesting com combined precast and in situ concrete barrel vaults not shells, but actually sort of <coughs> more straightforward, simple vaults. Some, actually, some of them not quite so simple and quite elaborate. Um, but a lot of my work after I set up my practice was based on real sort of orthogonal Mesian architecture, really sort of quite rigid thinking, some very beautiful, some very elegant structures, uh, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about these curved things. Um, the slide on the left there is the, 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 the project that we did with Future Systems for the Croydon Bridge, which hasn't been built and maybe never will be built, I don't know. But I'm going to talk about that a little, in a little detail later on. And on the slide on the right is <coughs> construction shot of the Cambridge Law Faculty, which was completed a year or so, 18 months ago or so, um, which is a curved vault. But I th there, I want to refer to a number of other things before I go back to talking about building structures. Um, 
which I think have some sort of relevance. Um, because if you think back, I can't date the shot on the left. I mean, I can't date the time those buildings were built because I can't remember, I'm afraid. They're the Trulli, which are in southern Italy, and they're a sort of indigenous form there, or they were in an indigenous form, and they're actually circular on plan. They're true cones. They're stone, and I think you can see quite clearly there, you know, they are actually uh, stone laid upon stone, gradually stepping in, and they form their own structure. And it's by virtue of their curvature in one sense that they actually work. And then you get, of course, the, you know, the Nervi Palazzo della Sport in Rome, which the column supports don't have any curvature in them, but the roof actually is a <coughs> is a curved dome with a wavy edge, which actually, domes are always quite efficient forms of structure. Now, when you start talking about structure in fashion, then you have the boned undergarment, like a corset, whatever it's called, on the left, which is an Edwardian, not invention, because it was developed from earlier times, where you get your, your curved form by use of um, bone stiffeners, um, I'm told, in excruciatingly uncomfortable because it, it, the whole object of the exercise was to pinch the waist in. Um, so there is a sort of bone structure there which modifies the person's form. But on the right, to get, you know, completely, the complete contrast in the 20s with the sort of dresses that this man Fortuny was designing. And uh, Professor Gordon, in his book, which is called Structures or Why Things Don't Fall Down, one of his early books, refers to Fortuny's work and the fact that he used cloth which was cut on the bias, which is on the diagonal. And, it's, and, and the, I'm not going to try and quote it now because I can't remember it and it takes too long, but there is a, a, a thing in there about this business of a thing called Poisson's Ratio, which is all to do with the way... Um, fabrics behave and materials behave in certain senses and certain loadings. And with bias cut fabric, you can actually make curved forms without ha the structure having virtually any fabric at all. His fabrics were all very, very fine. And if you wanted to buy any Fortuny fabrics or dresses, now it would cost you, cost you an absolute small fortune. And when you start talking about furniture, I've just got two examples here. One which is the early Thonne Bentwood chair, uh, which is made virtually the same today, but it's steamed beech, which is bent into those shapes, uh, which makes it... Um, it's actually a very, very stiff, very effective piece of furniture. It was very cheap, it's still relatively cheap. It's quite a clever thing to have done, and the person who invented it, I think, was absolutely brilliant. And you go to the Batoya chair there, which is steel, very fine rod, spot welded in, in a, <coughs> a, a, a mold, which again, it's quite light. It's very light, actually, I think, as a, as a chair. Uh, it has this double curved form, which makes it very stiff. It also has a form which I think makes it very comfortable. Um, so again, an example of curvature, making a, a structural form which is useful. If you start talking about vehicles, and I've got a few in here to talk about, um, the vehicles on the left, I don't know whether anybody knows what they are. Um, I thought that they were actually all Tatras from Czechoslovakia. And these, this slide is actually from a book by uh, Ivan Margolis, <coughs> who wrote a book on the history of the Tatra car. And the only Tatra there is the one in the background, uh, rear-engined, hence those air scoops. The other three are Fiat's, which were experimental and all designed really as curved forms to try and reduce the drag, increase their aerodynamic efficiency. I think it's quite interesting that, you know, they were the that was in the 30s and we're only now getting back to the sort of aerodynamic, uh, aerodynamic efficiency in cars that they had then because the whole thing went away on a different sort of tack. And of course, the bobsleigh um, which has to be streamlined, curved, 
because it has to go as fast as possible down that ghastly ice chute um, in, um, where is it? I always have to get the name wrong, St. Moritz. If anybody has the opportunity to go there, you should go and watch it. You can have a run on it, I'm told. Well, I know you can, but I didn't have the nerve to go on it, I'm afraid, because it travels about 90 miles an hour down this thing. <coughs> but it has to be streamlined, curved, uh, to give it maximum efficiency. And then, of course, talking about efficiency again, streamlining, is, is um, Donald Campbell's Bluebird car, of the, again of the 30s. I don't know how efficient that was aerodynamically. I mean, I think they thought it was terribly efficient. I don't know whether it would be now if it were tested in a wind tunnel. The car on the right was actually, or is, it isn't produced anymore. That's a, a thing called a Renault Alpine, A140, um, which had a very, very low drag coefficient. And the faster you went in it, the tighter it clung down to the road. And I can, uh, I can vouch for that because, in fact, that was my car and I've had it going very, very fast. And uh, the faster you go, the more stable it becomes. Again, it's a question of getting the curve, in this case, getting the curvature right to make it more efficient. I mean, you could get it up to 140 on a clear road <coughs> across Dartmoor, it's wonderful. And then, well, the freak on the left, I think, really. Um, somebody's idea of making a motorcycle aerodynamically efficient by housing it in this curved shell. Um, I don't know whether this is a one-off. I just came across it in a street in Paris one day and, and had a camera with me, so I photographed it. And you, it's actually a BMW bike, <coughs> little outriggers, so that it'll stand up when it's stationary. I mean, how you start it and sort of get it going and get the outriggers up, I'm not quite sure. I don't think it's terribly elegant, but I should think it's probably quite efficient. And of course, the high-speed train developments that have taken place, this happens to be the AVE train uh, in the station in Seville, which is streamlined, very quiet, very smooth. <coughs> and if you start talking about sa sail technology, membranes, then the, you can't make sails work on a yacht without curvature because the power relies on the slot, in fact, between the genera and the main sort, primarily. I mean, it's more complex than that. And the more efficient you can make the curvature of that sail, the faster the boat will go, providing, of course, that you design an efficient hull, which is then all dependent on curvature of the hull itself and wetted area. The least wetted area, the least surface of the hull that's touching the water <coughs> the faster that hull will go through the water up to a certain limit, which is dependent on all sorts of factors, including its length. But sail technology now, of course, is incredibly sophisticated. It used to be done by um, just experience, and now, of course, it's done by very carefully worked out computer calculations, and also with now with very high-tech materials, very lightweight, very strong materials, <coughs> mylars and kevlars and things like that. The only thing about it is that the sails, when they're used for racing, don't last very long because they get, they're very highly stressed and they tend to break up. And, well, bikes haven't changed very much ever since the sort of penny farthing finished and people started producing bikes with the front and rear wheel about the same diameter. You get something like that on the left, which I still think is really quite an efficient piece of um, machinery, particularly when you can use very lightweight materials for the frame so your power to rate ratio goes up. That's nothing to do with curvature at all, really. But when you come to the Lotus bike and its rider, then they, <coughs> there is an article, and I can't remember where it occurred. I have a copy of it in the office of the development of that bike and the experiments they did and the curious things that they found, like the front fork. Normally, front forks are a pair coming one side, either side of the wheel. This front fork actually only comes down one side. And my immediate reaction was, gosh, well, that's asymmetric. That's going to cause um, curious sort of wind vortices or whatever. It'll throw the whole thing out of balance. And apparently due to, <coughs> as a result of the experiments they did, they reckoned it was more efficient. 
I don't know why, but it was. And there are all sorts of streamlined bits there which are nothing to do with arting it up or fashion, but all to do with making it go faster. And also, of course, the way the rider's clad makes him go faster. The least resistance to the wind makes him, more, him and the bike more efficient. And, well, I put these in as the, the one on the left, actually, because it just happens to be a favorite of mine. George, George Cayley, so George Cayley reputedly was the first person who ever got a flying machine into the air. It wasn't, it, it wasn't powered, of course. It was a glider, and you can see here. This is a replica, which was built by Siba Geige some years ago, because somebody at Siba Geige said they thought they could make it and get it to fly, and it did. So they did this great thing. <coughs> but, of course, it didn't go very well, <coughs> and it had a pretty high wind resistance, and it was um, not very efficient. But it was probably the first. And then you come to the sailplane, where things like that, the whole thing is streamlined to the point where, where the wings join the root, because they, you take them to bits to transport them. The joint between the wing and the root, which is very narrow, it's probably, if it's properly made, it's probably about one and a half mil. That one and a half mil gap, which runs all the way around the ring, is actually then sealed with a piece of very fine white tape which increases the efficiency of the whole thing in its flying mode. <coughs> I only found that out by accident, talking to a glider pilot. It's so critical. <coughs> they didn't know that much about curvature and structural e efficiency in, t in terms of aerodynamics when the S6B was around, so they used a very powerful engine, which subsequently went into the Spitfire, which was a Second World War um, fighter plane, and very very um, very successful. So it was really sort of rather brute force. But you can see there attempts at trying to sort of streamline the cowlings there. And of course the Concord is the opposite where everything has to be considered in terms of uh, it might be curved, it might be flat, but everything has to be sort of run together in a sort of seamless way that will make it as, as fly as fast as it can without, um, well apart from anything else, overheating as it goes so fast through the air, so sophisticated metals are used in that as well as streamlining. Now talking about structures, um, put my notes out of order, never mind. Um, I've picked out a few which I think are quite significant in terms of why they work, because they're curved. The one on the left is the Keeble Palace in um, Glasgow. It has a dome. It also has some <coughs> um, pieces of structure and glass that run off for it, fr from it, from, one, from the, the sides, which have the most beautiful cu double curved linking pieces, very beautiful bits of geometry. But this is a dome. It's very simple, very straightforward. It's incredibly light, as you can see. Those bars are tiny, wrought iron, separated by little pieces of glass. Separated, I think, is probably the word, because I'm quite certain that the, the way that works as a structure is as an integral piece. I suppose, you could, I suppose the modern term probably would be monocoque, perhaps, because the glass is definitely working in conjunction with the wrought iron. Uh, if the glass weren't there, then those wrought iron ribs, I think, would buckle. Um, certainly, if any significant load was put on the top, they would, so that the whole thing works as one. It is interesting that it is actually deformed on plan, as I think you can probably see. It's twisted slightly. It's as though somebody put it down and turned and, and, and rotated it slightly. And I think that's perhaps what happened, that it was propped up and it slipped slightly in some way and they decided, well, you know, rather than try and get it back to where it was before, which would, be, would have been extremely difficult, we'll just fill the glass in like, you know, We'll recut the glass and we'll drop them into the slots that are there. That's only a theory of mine. But I can't think of any other reason why it's twisted, because I don't think the designer would have designed it slightly twisted like that somehow. It doesn't look as though it was conceived that way. On the right is part of the uh, palm house at Kew, where this piece of structure, of course, is supported on a series of parabolic arches, uh, which are an efficient piece of structure. Uh, then you have the secondary 
curved wrought iron glazing bars. Um, <coughs> are not only more efficient, but actually I think very much more interesting as a structure and a piece of architecture. And then you have on the left the great, I think it's called the great stove, actually, or the stove. It's, it's, a, it's a plant house, but it, 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 is, it has a, a, a solid back wall. It's a Bicton down in Devon which is even finer than the Cubal Palace. I, I mean, I look at those columns. Of course, they're nothing to do with curved structure, but I mean, they're cast iron. They're about 100 mil diameter, if I remember rightly. I mean, I actually took this shot. And they're very tall and very slender. They're not carrying that much load. But I don't reckon that any of us as engineers could justify those today, probably. They, you know, they, they would apparently by calculation probably buckle out of existence. But they're still there and they've been there for a hundred and something years. You have the Grand Palais in Paris, which actually I rather wish I hadn't put in because although it's a sort of series of curved structures, vaults, dome, etc., when you compare the two together, I think it's a bit unfair on the Grand Palais because it's um, rather hefty. And perhaps if I have to give this talk again, I'll take that out and replace it with something else. But having said that, of course, it's a very big building, as you may know. Um, it is enormous. You go inside and it is like a great glass cathedral. Curvature again from different ages. I mean, double curvature on plan. This is York Station on the left, the wrought iron beams, curved arches. Arches work extremely efficiently providing you can find something at the ends of the abutments to hold the horizontal forces that occur. Um, it's all right when you're going one to the other to the other, but it's when you come to the end that you have a problem to sort out. And on the right is um, not a very good slide, I'm afraid, uh, the Dome of Discovery at the Festival of Britain in 1951, which is a three-way lattice structure in aluminium. <coughs> It was, we can't go and see it, of course, because it ain't there anymore, an absolutely, I think, an absolutely beautiful piece of structure, a very fine building, designed by Freeman Fox. Um, I can't imagine why, well, I can, because it was a political decision, I think, but I was going to say I can't imagine why it and the Skylon, among others, should have been destroyed after the end of the exhibition. Um, it would have got, made a good thing for the millennium rather than the thing that's going up at Greenwich, I suspect. But perhaps, that's, uh, perhaps I shouldn't say that. <coughs> and then, of course, the use of concrete, curved concrete. Bryn Mawr on the left, which I think is still in existence, but only just, and I think it's probably going to be pulled down because nobody can find a use for it. It was the rubber factory designed by uh, Arabs, actually, I seem to remember. Arabs were the engineers for that. I think ACP were the architects. Huge double curved vaults, and you can see what then you, have, you do at the edge. If you want a vertical edge, you glaze it in. Incredibly efficient piece of structure, very thin. And on the right, Felix Candela structure, again, probably a maximum of 50 mil thick, I would think, that shell there. Again, using curvature to give you structural efficiency. And, well, the thing on the left is the St. Louis Arch, which I think is one of the most spectacular things I've ever been to see, in the sense that it is enormous. It's actually very beautiful, because it's so simple. It is a parabolic arch in elevation, which in cross-section is triangular. And, of course, the triangular section varies from the maximum at the bottom of the base up to this very thin thing at the top. And I don't know whether anybody's ever been there, but if you go anywhere near St. Louis, you should try and get to see it. Because it comes down to a concrete base, and the concrete base is actually then goes, continues underground. And you go underground, and you get into a, you, you, you get to a series of little sliding doors, lift-type doors, and you get into what in is, is in effect a gondola. It's a four-person gondola, rather like the ski lifts. And you get into this, and the door's shut, and you're in the dark, and it starts trundling up, and it goes up this amazing trajectory. And as it goes up, you suddenly come into this, this section here, which is a steel frame inside. Not very special, quite crude. 
uh, and it's, got, it's lit inside, and you get this gondola goes up, and it goes up and up and up and up and up, and it comes to about there, and it stops. And some lift doors open, and you get out, and you're in this space at the top, which is about a third the width of this room. <coughs> it has a flat floor, of course. <coughs> Walls are slope out, and then a ceiling, a roof. And the walls have glass on them, armor plate, fortunately. And you walk along, and you look through this glass, and there's absolutely nothing between you and the ground. There's nothing underneath you. This is falling away. If you have vertigo, don't go up there. But it is abso an absolute... I mean, I don't like doing things like that normally. I don't like going on these sort of touristy things in uh, foreign cities, but I couldn't resist this, and I'm, I'm so glad I did it. Um, the other thing is that they have their <coughs> a film which actually I reckon all schools should have, of its construction, which is actually very well made. And you can see that before you go up this thing. They have a lecture theater there. And of course, well, that's all steel. This is all concrete. This is the Guggenheim Museum, uh, which is curved inside. And of course, it's, sorry, this is curved drum outside as well of reducing dimensions as it comes down towards the ground. An absolutely beautiful use, I think, of curved concrete. It's a fabulous building, Frank Lloyd Wright. I don't know who designed this, I'm afraid. Was it Saarinen? And uh, who was the engineer? Uh, I could take a guess, but I can't remember. Um, probably Lev Zetlin or somebody. Could have been. I did, I've forgotten it was Saarinen, that's right. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> then a couple of, well, other ways of using, using concrete. I. I went to Ronchon recently. I went there many years ago, and I went there about a year ago and discovered a whole series of little books on its construction, which I'd never seen. And this, I mean, it is all, it's a sort, this is a sort of mishmash of concrete and block work, I think, rendered, if I remember right. But this is all a reinforced concrete roof of a very free-form shape and varying thickness. And in this book are illustrations of it under construction with the reinforcement. It's quite fascinating, actually. I mean, it's, it's the sort of thing that really, as an engineer, you have to sort of, sort of do a bit of a lash up because there is, there's not a sort of, it doesn't seem to be an entirely logical way of setting the reinforcement to make it work. But all I'm saying really is, you know, that it, I, th I think personally that, you know, this is one of Corb's great works. And if I'm anywhere, near Ronchon, which is down in southeastern France. I'll make a vast detour to go and see it again because it is so beautiful and it's such a lovely place to go to and it's so beautifully sited on top of a hill. Um, and here, I, I have great concerns about this actually. I put it in deliberately to talk about because it's a, a refectory for a convent in Graz, which was designed by Gunter Dominic a long, long time ago. It's one of his early buildings. The rest of the convent is all sort of straightforward and some very early buildings. And most of his work at that time was very rectilinear. And this is the beginning, I think, of his sort of what I call his mad phase. Um, it's, it's concrete. It's, uh, it was, um, I can't remember whether it was sprayed or plastered. I think it was plastered uh, onto a sort of steel armature with steel mesh. And it's, I mean, it has a central axis there, but this is all free form, as it were. These, both the sides are the same as one another, but it sort of humps up and down all over the place. And, um, of course, if it didn't have those curvatures, it is, a, it is, I suppose, a sort of, it's a folded plate structure of some sort. Um, I don't like it as a build, I don't like it as a form. I find it very un... un um, I feel very uneasy about it, but as a piece of structure and construction, it's absolutely fascinating. Let's say there, is, there would only have been one way of constructing that. <coughs> and then uh, the Knit building, I think that's how you pronounce it in Paris at La Défense, which was, I think, Bernard Zerfus and Jean Prouvé had a hand in it. This vast, great vault, uh, vault which is a a three-pointed star on plan. It just has three points of support, none of which you can see anymore because they've gone and sort of... This is a hotel inside it. You probably all know it, actually. You've probably been there. 
Uh, they, they subsequently built a hotel inside, which I think is a pretty sort of hideous thing to do to a wonderful, vast exhibition space, which is what it was designed as. And of course, the Sydney Opera House, which is a series of, well, shells, for want of a better word, curved shells, Gutson and Ovarabs. I don't know who the engineer was on this one, I'm afraid, on the, this, this one here. And <clears throat> finally, in this little series, as it were, two things that you certainly couldn't do without curvature. On the left is the Montreal Dome, Bucky Fuller's Dome, which I think is probably the biggest dome he ever did, and maybe it's the biggest dome in the world. I'm not sure about that. It's probably also the lightest structure in terms of area covered or volume enclosed. Certainly, I would say volume enclosed. And Bucky had this thing, as you probably know, about um, getting the weight of things down to the absolute minimum. Um, and it is a spectacular piece of structure, absolutely fabulous. And on the right is the Hong Kong aviary at Ocean Park, which is just a sort of mist, as it were. It's a crimped st stainless steel crimped wire mesh double curved. It is a membrane. It's a true structural membrane designed by Bureau Hapold, um, which if anybody ever has, is ever going to Hong Kong, you must try and go to Ocean Park, I think, for two reasons. One, to see this, and secondly, to take the cable car ride from the bottom to the top, which is the longest and highest cable car ride I've ever done, and is absolutely terrifying, but wonderful, because you can see everything from it. But you have to do the whole circuit of Ocean Park. You can't sort of dive in halfway. So you have to devote most of the day to it. And you go down the longest escalator in the world and you can go on a wet boat ride and all sorts of silly things like that. It's fun for a day out. It's a bit hot. Now coming back to some of our work. Um, this is a dome that we built in a place called Crestone, which is in Colorado up in the Rocky Mountains. It's about 10,500 feet up. So the area is nice and dry and hot in the summer, very cold in the winter. This was a project it was designed by Keith Critchlow. Um, I think Cr Keith Critchlow is probably unclassifiable, isn't he? He's an architect, designer, painter, guru, expert on Islamic patterns, etc. He came to us, he came to, yes, he came to us and he said he'd, he'd been commissioned to design this building which was exclusively for meditation. It had to be all in timber, preferably it had to have no metal work in it at all, no metal in the joints, and it was to be built by amateur labor, and it was to be built miles from anywhere. I mean, the nearest town to this is 50 miles, and the road from the local village to the town is straight, 50 miles straight, straight down the valley. But the town when you get there is sort of, uh, it's got a Hagen Das and it's got a um, McDonald's I think and it's got a very good hardware shop and I think it might have a cinema and that's about it. So this really is, you know, out in the wilds. But it's part of a development that was being created by somebody as a sort of um, study center. <coughs> It was all built by amateur labor with two sort of experts, as it were, one of whom was the job foreman, who was an American, I think he was an architect by training, and the other guy was resident engineer, who was a guy called David Tasker, who I used to teach here at one time, who worked for me and then came back to do this job for me. <coughs> we built a, an internal scaffold, as it were, built these, but these are laminated up by hand out of four inch by two inch, sorry about the imperial, but that's what it was, four inch by two inch softwood timbers, layer upon layer, on this jig as it were, this vertical jig, laid up, clamped, I mean somebody asked me the other day when I was talking about this, you know, couldn't you come back and give a whole lecture about how you built this thing, and I said, well yes I could, I could spend at least an hour talking about it, if not two. So, but I, you know, I've got other things to talk about tonight. But the whole thing was laminated up. One layer put on, glue, cramped. Next layer put on, glue, cramped. But they were put on in sequence, one over the other, rather like you build a basket. 
Hence, no metalwork in the joints, because that's a sort of that joint works structurally, and they're all like that. And then the secondary structure, which is laid up in two directions, actually, in the end, they were all hardwood timber pegged. No, uh, and glue? No, no glue, I don't think. And no metalwork again. And then the whole thing was skinned in timber. So it became like an upside-down bowl. Of course, what we did conclude when we built it was that the skin and the secondary ribs would probably have formed the structure without the 12-pointed star, which is these main sections here. You could have taken those away because it was vastly overstructured. But the concept was that it should be this star, this sacred 12-pointed star, with this oculus in the middle that lets the light into the meditation center. Fascinating job, actually. I went out there a number of times and spent quite a lot of time actually helping on site and supervising, but actually carrying bits around because, you know, you don't want to stand around when other people are working. You know, it wasn't as though it was unionized, the site. You know, you, couldn't, you didn't wear hard hats or anything. You wore shorts and a T-shirt. <coughs> and then... That, of course, was a dome, and domes are efficient, and uh, I'd say, well, structurally, that wasn't terribly efficient, but we could have made it very efficient. Then we come to the Acropolis Museum competition entry with Future Systems, which regrettably didn't get anywhere. And we have this sort of free-form perimeter here, which is a concrete, an inclined concrete berm, as it were, then covered in earth, and then from that sprung, sorry, you can't really see it very clearly, from, a grid shell in steel, three-way, yes, a three-way grid shell, virental structural form, which was then clad, in, glazed, but with glazing of varying densities, depending on which uh, its aspect. So it gets denser as it goes towards the south. And then a ribbon bridge, which is just hung from there to there. The Acropolis is up here. And we were very excited about this. Um, and this lovely curved form. Uh, it didn't even get to second stage, actually, so, you know, blown that one. And on the right is something that's actually under construction at the moment, which is the um, control tower for Bordeaux Airport, which we're doing with um, two architects. We're doing this from our French office. A man called uh, Jean-Luc Arsène and... Um, Consultant architect is Philip Stark. You might be able to see the Starkian sort of emphasis here somewhere. But, I mean, I think air airport control towers are usually pretty sort of boring, and of course they have to have certain things to make them work, and you have to be able to see out of them, and you've got to have things on top of them. But I think actually this will be quite an interesting curved form in the end. Um, not entirely logical as a piece of structure. I mean, you could look at that and say, well, you know, you could have probably done the structure more efficiently. <coughs> then, of course, curved structure in a totally different sense for the Don Valley Stadium. Teflon glass membranes, which, of course, membranes don't work unless they have double curvature built into them and they're stressed up so that they can't flutter, flap about, whatever. And we have two basic forms here. We have the standard one, as it were, where you have a pair of arches here and the curvature there, there and, a, and, and a free-form curved front with a cable in it, and similarly at the rear. But when you turn the corner, this is a straight piece here, and then you crank round the corner here and crank round the corner there. This infill, as it were, is a cone with a flying strut inside with tension cables to hold the strut in place and to force the membrane up into its conic shape. Um, the rest of the structure is actually a perfectly conventional mixture of um, structural steel and reinforced in situ and precast concrete here. And then <coughs> another stadium um, where again, I mean there only seem to be only a limited number of ways of doing stadia. Uh, certainly if you want to make the seating efficient and get all the sight lines right so there's no structure in the way, this is one of the other ways of doing it with this enormous great banana truss. This is quite big actually, it's 135 meter span. This is um, Kirkley Stadium at Huddersfield, the Calpine Stadium, 
and there are two of these facing one another and a shorter one this end and hopefully there's just about to be a shorter one this end as well to close the gap as it were. Um, it's a very efficient way of holding that roof up. It's also very economic. Um, and in fact, it's become a bit of a landmark. And it's helped, I mean, partly, partly because the structure is, is so um, recognizable, and that partly because the, the facilities they now have at that ground are so much better than they had before that it's increased the attendance, their, their soccer and their raga matches enormously. And it's also apparently improved the performance of the team. And, and maybe it is something to do with having a good building to go to and a good build, you know, a good, good stand, a stadium to play in. I hope that's right. I can't prove it. <coughs> and then a, another membrane where, again, you can't do membranes without curvature. This is um, Stratford bus station in the East End, just to a night shot of it and one of the detailed shots. You see how you have to sort of pattern the membrane to get the curvature and the, the, the varying curvature panels to come into this neck here, which then the rainwater comes down, down there and straight down the column and out into a drain. Uh, these are individual units, which are then linked together. What you can't see here, because it's dark, is that there are a series of masts that stick up here, um, which help to hold the framework which is in at this horizontal level. Uh, the Croydon Bridge again. I think one of the things we elected to do here was we wanted to make it more interesting, more exciting. We only had three points of support that we could use. One was there, one was there, and the other one was somewhere down here. They were fixed. Couldn't do anything about that. This spans a four-lane highway, sort of in an urban motorway thing. And it could, of course, have gone as a, in a straight line from there to there and a straight line from there down to there. And Jan said, well, it would be much more interesting, surely, if it's a curve. And um, I, I had to agree. And we came up with this sort of, it's almost a, parabolic hoop on plan which then of course is canted up for this intermediate support and the whole thing is asymmetric um, and the cross section through here is asymmetric as well the cables come down they're rods actually not cables come down to the far side of this thing they come down to this side here and then you have this which is yes asymmetric in cross section as well and has more mass this side than the other to act as a counterbalance because one of the problems about structures like this is that they go into torsion. And torsion is one of the things that engineers really don't like dealing with very much because it's very difficult, causes all sorts of problems. Um, nevertheless, that's what we wanted to do and that's how we developed it. Um, and as I say, one day we might get it built. And of course, you have, you have a mast here but you have to backstay it, stop it falling over. This is West India Key Bridge, which was completed recently, which really has curvature to it, partly from the elegance point of view, because I think that if you produce a flat bridge, A, it looks as if it's sagging, and B, that it doesn't seem to have the right feeling about it. And what we did here was to get the maximum rise that we could to comply with the regulations around disabled use. Um, and that gives us another advantage in that it gives you a bit of extra height here for certain to the general types of boat that go through. Having said that, there is one boat that has to go through it once a week whereby we have to open the bridge. So it has a pair of bascules that lift up like that, which are hydraulically actu actuated, which are, but are counterbalanced. Um, but as I say, the curvature really there came more, I suppose, from reasons of what we felt it ought to be than what it needed to be structurally. Makes it, I was going to say it makes it marginally more efficient, but I think it is very marginal, probably. <coughs> and then, well, Waterloo. 
I expect you've had umpteen talks about Waterloo, or you know all about it, and it's been in all the magazines, and it's won a lot of prizes and things. Um, I'll talk about it very briefly, because there are certain aspects of its curvature which come out of the constraints of the site. That slide on the right, incidentally, is back to front, I think. I have to think about it now. No, it isn't. No, it's the wrong way. It's the right way around. The, as you probably know, the site is curved on plan. It tapers from this end here, the concourse end down. It tapers considerably from about 48 metres across here to about 35 down the far end. And the position of the railway tracks, although they are new, are exactly the same positions as the original tracks which were there before because there isn't anywhere else to put them. Um, because the whole station is fixed. It's elevated on a series of brick arches, or it was, and the boundary to British Rail land is along that line there. And the boundary here is where it is because beyond that is another platform. So you're absolutely fixed with that. There was another constraint which sort of got thrown in at a later date, and that was that British Rail, in their wisdom, uh, British Rail Property Board, decided that they were going to promote a huge building over the top of this, an air rights building, as it were, designed by another firm of architects. Sort of monstrous thing. There was a great hoo ha about it, and a great row about it, and in fact, it all got scotched in the end. But before it got scotched, we were set a height limit for our terminal building, which would then have run underneath this new major commercial development. <coughs> and that, I mean, I think otherwise, what we might have ended up with was a cross section which was symmetrical and probably parabolic, because we wouldn't have had a height restriction, or it may, may have been a modified parabola. In the, in, because of the circumstances, we had this height restriction. And we had one other thing, which is an oddity, and that is that along this edge here, there is no platform, because the track is there. And therefore, the trains that are coming in on this outer track are very close to this structure. And if we'd done a shallower structure, this shallower curve, this side, like that, the trains would have actually come in and banged their heads on our structure, which wouldn't have been very clever. Um, as a result of all these factors, and I mean this was no easy decision, and you can imagine that we went through a whole series of model studies, physical model studies, and a whole series of CAD studies, um, and then culminating with a full-scale prototype, which subsequently became part of the building structure. We came up with this asymmetric shape, so it's steep this side and shallower that side. It's a very simple structural concept, it's a three-pin arch. But this pin happens to be offset from the center line of the thing. And as a consequence of that, it behaves differently structurally. And you get, so that you get, we took that as an opportunity. And on one side, on the left-hand side, on this left slide, you have, so to think about this, compression booms in the top and tension in the bottom. On this side, you have tension booms, as it were, in the top and compression in the bottom because of its structural behavior. And that gave us, and the architect, of course, the opportunity to do different things with different sides. This side faces the street, which faces York Road and is all glazed. And we were elected then to hang the glazing on the inside, forming a series of facets, not curves, with articulated joints because of the complications of the geometry. And the other side, as you see there, is part glazed and part stainless steel clad. Now, again, you know, one could do to our lecture on this building. Uh, just a few of the details. This is, this is a detail of the center pin joint, and some of the castings. And there on the right is the, the shot looking from the other end, from the, what I call the downstream end, um, at night, um, seeing the sort of thing that snakes. And I see, you think you can see there some of the, the problems that we had with the geometry. I must say that I think if we hadn't had a, you know, our sort of fairly sophisticated computing, it would have been extremely difficult to actually do, solve the geometry of this problem. 
let alone um, some of the analyses. Um, because once you've set the model up accurately, then of course you can play with it in a number of ways. You can look at all sorts of options without actually having to it, it to take very long. Uh, but if you had to do the whole thing by hand, you know, each time you change something, you had to redo it. I think it would be an absolute nightmare. <coughs> The Cambridge Law Faculty. Um, gosh, we're nearly there. Um, Cambridge Law Faculty really is, is it's, it's a combination of fairly hefty, massive reinforced concrete internally. It's a high mass building deliberately to keep the heating load down, the heat gains down, and to, 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 to make it environmentally more useful, as it were. You have this series of cantilever galleries which step back at each floor. You probably all know this. A series of raking columns at the front. And then over the whole thing is this steel vault which goes over to about there, which is a three-way lattice, Verendil, girder form again. And you can just, you can see them here in the end. And um, then, of course, this meets up with this wall here, which is a cut on plan is cut off at 45 degrees to the main vault, which gives us some real geometric fun as well, because when you come to draw that, it, you know the way one sketches things, and you say, oh, well, yes, you, you know, you've got this curved vault, and it's actually constant radius, and, okay, it's like half part of a sausage roll, and you cut it off at, right hand, at, at 45 degrees one end, and um, you should end up with a straight line there, but actually the way this geometry works and the way you have to node all these things out, you end up with a curved line there. And we had terrific arguments with guys in Foster's, guys in my office, about this and how the geometry really worked until we set it up properly on the computer. And then, of course, it all fell out like that. So we had to design this wall on a curve with some tall mullions. Um, and that, that is the wall I was referring to there, the curved wall with its tall mullions. And on the right is the, end, the other end of the vault. And you can see, I think, quite clearly there, the form of structure behind, three-way. And this quite sophisticated glazing system, double glazed, sitting on an aluminium frame, subframe, which itself is propped off the steel frame, and then silicon glazed externally and the eyebrow there, which keeps the sun off from the very high, the highest sun angles during about two weeks of the high summer. And, well, I guess that wouldn't have been the only way of doing that building, um, because at the beginning of the design of buildings, you know, people have their own ideas, they have concepts, they have perhaps preconceptions sometimes of what they think the building might be. And I mean, I think engineers sometimes have preconceptions as well as architects. And if those preconceptions are forcing the thing into the wrong mold, then I think they have to be abandoned. But if they appear to be the right solution, then one usually progresses them. And finally, the Eden Project. Now, we still don't know where this is going ahead, and I might hear tomorrow, actually. I'm, in fact, dying to get back to the office to find out what the Millennium Commission said yesterday about our latest submission. This is a, well, I suppose you'd call it a plant house, for want of a better word, in what is at the moment uh, a China clay pit, which is like a gigantic moon crater. It's just north of St. Austell in Cornwall, in a place called Bedelva. And this thing is about a kilometer long. It has similarities with Waterloo in the sense, it's longer than Waterloo, it's about two and a half times as long but in the sense that it has a varying width. This is 65, no, sorry. This is 120 meters across here, maximum. But it tapers down to something like, I think, 30 or something. And it varies. It's rather like a snake that's eaten something and hasn't digested it properly. But it not only does that, but it curves around the corner again. So we have the similar geometric problems that we had on Waterloo, only worse. Fascinating things to solve, actually. Uh, and we've developed a different Again, I can't, you know, if you want to cover vast spaces like this, this, this is 65 meters here. It's quite big. 
Um, and we, have, we will have, we hope, full height rainforest trees in there, about 50 meters high. And as you can see, a series of walkways zipping through, you know, mid-level for people to go and view the stuff at a higher level than ground. Um, <coughs> I guess there would be other ways of doing this, but it seemed to all of us, you know, that the most sensible thing to do would be to come up with some sort of arch, vaulted structure, which, if we work hard at it, and we have done, you can make it very lightweight structurally, very efficient, <coughs> which certainly it needs to be if it's spanning 120 meters. And here we have a system whereby we've got a central compression tube and an outer boom, which is in tension, and an inner boom, which is tension. So that only half that structure is working at a time, depending on whether it's being loaded downwards or upwards, because wind load is significant down here. Um, and you might say, of course, well, that sounds like terribly efficient because you're only ever using half the depth. But actually, we've managed to come up with a system whereby it is quite efficient and it makes a, makes a very lightweight structure. But the other thing about it is that we're not using glass on this at all. We're using a thing called ET foil, um, which is ethyl tetrafluorethylene, if I remember rightly, which is a relatively new thing, although it is, it is tried and tested, which is a plastic film using a pair of films, one above the other, forming a pillow, which is then inflated with air, not with gas. And you can make these pillows, in effect, any length you like. There is a limit on the width. And so this whole lot is clad in these pillows, which then have a series of little pumps and little tiny, tiny feed tubes to keep them inflated. But you can do all sorts of things, other things with this um, foil is plastic because you can you can vary its transparency stroke translucency in manufacture and I suspect that in fact I know although we haven't gone into this technology in detail that there are where if you use certain other instead of air use certain gases inside this pillow then you could actually vary the opacity if you like to call it that the translucency by modifying the state of the gas that was inside it. But I think that's going technologically too far for this. We don't actually need to do that. Um, so, I think I've been, fairly, I've been very selective about the things I've shown tonight because I actually wanted to talk about curved structures, not straight ones, as it were. But I don't think in all the structures that I've shown, whether it be they ours or other people's, there are very few examples of structures where the curvature isn't contributing to the efficiency in some way. Um, so, although I think there's a degree of fashion in some people's work at the moment in terms of curved structures, I think that largely the engineers are, are actually benefiting from being able to produce extra efficiency. But um, I suppose I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I've been involved in so many curved structures recently and um, somebody might like to comment on what I've been saying. Thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting question. In fact, somebody asked me a similar question the other night, and I, 
Um, we, we seem, as, as a firm, we seem to have had very few opportunities of, of actually designing and developing monocoque structures, which of course can be very much more efficient. I agree. I mean, and things like the Wellington bomber, of course, which was this incredibly lightweight framework, which was then skinned, and the frame and the skin worked together to make the structure. And we're doing, we're doing a bridge like that at the moment. Well, we might be. I'm not sure that's going to happen, in fact, where that will be a true monocoque structure, which will be a bit like the Wellington bomber, um, except that it's got a crank in the middle, because, again, it's a bridge that has to go like that. But... And I think the, yeah, I don't, I'm, mm, I'm just thinking. Well, yes, yes, Peter, I think it's partly that, but I think it's partly also that there isn't, um, you might well, I think, get the drive from certain engineers, and you'd certainly get it from, from me and us in our office, and I think you'd probably get it from Tim as well, but a lot of engineers are, are very averse to that sort of thing because, you, you get into very complex calculations. But I think the other thing, perhaps, is that <coughs> there are a lot, a lot of architects who would pay lip service to this marvelous sort of monocoque thing, but actually when it comes down to the buildings that they design, they don't want it. Because one of the few exceptions to that would be future systems, who, you know, know all about monocoque structures and Wellington bombers and God knows what else, and are passionate about that way of approaching things and um, I, I'm just trying to think of other examples where perhaps we should have been making use of the skin as well as the structure. Now there is, there is one example of course which is a very plain and boring one which occurs quite a lot in practice but people probably don't know much about and that is that if you, if you think about lightweight roof structures it's very often the case that you will use a profile metal deck with more than the normal, the standard fixings as it were, to work for you as a part of the structure, as a diaphragm, which is going some way towards that monocoque thing, you know. So you're using that deck actually up to its limit and being able to reduce the amount of supporting structure. But they don't normally come across as sort of elegant monocoque structures, might occasionally. Um, yeah, it's an it's interesting subject. But I, I mean, I, yes. Yes. Yes, I, 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 yeah, I think that's true also. And if you go to any of the steel fabricators, and, and even the really so-called sophisticated ones, you'll find that the processes they're using, if you can call it that, are actually pretty basic. They really are. I mean, they're very efficient in what they do, but they're incredibly basic. And I can think of one exception, actually, and that's some of the bits that are being made for the new parliament. I actually saw them under construction recently, and they are, they are a combination of um, steel um, armatures, as it were, st uh, stiffeners and plate. But, I mean, that's, that's very special and very exceptional and actually not really... It's not exactly a lightweight, stress-skin monocoque construction anyway. If you look at it, it's really heavy and gutsy, and I think it's pretty awful, but that's a matter of opinion. Um, but I think, I think you're right that the, and if you look at Prouvé's work and you look through his books and his, you know, and his sketchbooks and things like that, this is what he was trying to do and what he was doing and, and developing techniques of folding metal so that it may, you know, thin sheet metal then makes it efficient, spot welding bits together. Um, that has never really, that 
way of thinking and designing and working has never really taken off in this country with regard to buildings. Well, I can't think, well, not, not seriously anyway. I mean, it may be, perhaps it's getting off the subject actually, but if the, you know, the whole, the whole business in the, when was it? I suppose it was the late 60s and early 70s, the whole industrialized building thing. And there was a, this magazine called IB, wasn't there? probably don't remember it. I used to take it. Well, because I was fascinated by industrialized building and, you know, kits, things like this. And there were people beginning to develop things which were stress, stress skin type products with combinations of um, all in steel. But of course, the whole industrialized building thing got itself an incredibly bad name, blew apart, sometimes literally. And um, development of that sort of thing ground to a halt. Uh, I mean, I know one guy, for instance, who's been trying, I mean, marvelous idea. He had, he had this idea of taking the basic container framework and developing it with stiffening panels, a lighter container, and making sort of semi-monocot structures, and you could use them for all sorts of things if you think about it. Never, and he's been working on, on, on this idea for 20 years, probably. Never got anywhere with it. Never got any support, really. Always about to get somewhere, and then people have backed off. Um, <coughs> we've got the wrong... Perhaps we haven't got the right manufacturing base here. You know, the manufacturers aren't collaborating with the designers or the other way around. Um, but we also, I think, have the wrong... Well, I think we're very backward in some ways in this country about thinking about things like that. And I'm trying to think of a country where you might be able to do, you know, use more advanced ideas. Can't think of it. was heavy, and that, and, and in fact, it's. it's Interesting, you say that, because in a way, that dome was a bit sort of anti-Critchlow, because Critchlow was a great sort of proponent of um, lightweight structures that people like Bart Mr. Fuller were producing. Uh, he knew all about using uh, plywood and producing lightweight wooden structures. It, I think he got sidetracked, if that's the right word there, by this whole sacred geometry bit. Because the thing about this dome was that it had to be a 12-pointed star on plan. That was the first thing. And the first model that he'd made, I've got slides of it actually, it's about this size, was the main structure, this 12-pointed star. And that was the sort of guts of the whole thing. That's what was in his mind, as it were, as to what it had to be for some sacred geometrical reason. Consequently, everything then went on from that, you know, developed from that. And it's not an efficient structure, not in terms of use of material. As I said, you know, it's, it's, there's, 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 there's one layer too much of structure there, really. At least, perhaps two. Because it's only, I didn't say, but it's 60 foot diameter, that thing, so it's not very big, really. You know, if you put it up in the square there, you sort of, and you could have done it, I mean, so many different ways. And, I mean, you could have done it, of course, as a plywood stressed skin with very simple stiffening ribs underneath. Probably only single layer plywood on the outside. And of course it would stand up. Partly because it's double curved. But, I mean, Keith, say, Keith not, his work isn't, before that was not normally like that. It wasn't overstructured at all. Oh, yes, the Keeble Palace. Well, I think it did. Yes, how much does that have to do with bringing the, doing the work on site as opposed to manufacturing off site, bringing the section to the site? Gosh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I only have my own theories about that because I don't know that it's ever been written up in any way, but it. I don't think it did necessarily because if you. If, 
I went to the palm house at Kew when they were taking it to bits before they did the refurb because I was lucky enough to get a visit and I got a piece of one of the ribs actually a piece of wrought iron it's lovely it's quite fine too and it's almost it, it's, and it's, it's uncorroded but they had terrible corrosion problems elsewhere so they had to take it all to bits and rebuild it but those ribs the secondary ribs in the palm house and probably in the Keeble Palace I don't know were quite precise and I think I'm right in saying that they were actually quite accurately positioned in relation to one another so um, I would have thought, and the Keeble Palace might be the exception to the rule, that they could have produced all the glass pieces that slot in, in the workshop, on the, on the bay's cloth, as it were, like this is here, and just brought them along, dropped them into place, and putty them in. But of course, what they might have done, because labour was cheap in those days and they could have set a workshop up on site, was to cut all the glass on site. And they, you know, they get somebody up there, take a series of measurements and say, well, okay, it goes from, this, this run down here goes from so-and-so to so-and-so and the variation is only about, you know, sixteenth of an inch or something that it would have been then. Well, that's all right. We'll, if, we, if we make them all the, the minimum dimension, the ones that are a, a bit narrow, it doesn't matter because it's only a 32nd of an inch either side, that's all right because that'll get filled up with the putty. So we just drop them in, sort of modular thing. Probably something like that. Um, but I'm guessing. But that was a very important house uh, for the issues of the whole thing because the uh, part of yes. Yes, it was. Yes. Yes, I think, I think that's true, and I think that's beginning to apply in other senses as well, actually, in that, just to give you one example, um, on, uh, it's not a building I showed tonight because it wasn't relevant to what I was talking about, but on Lloyd's Register of Shipping, which we're doing with Roger's office, Richard Rogers, um, we wanted originally to do the majority of the, the reinforced concrete frame pre-cast. And we did a whole series of early exercises with precast concrete manufacturers and then at the first stage tender with contractors and it was actually apparently coming out to be about a third more expensive 30% more expensive than doing it in situ but what transpired in the end was that talking to certain people, certain contractors they took the opposite view and they said, because of the certain efficiencies that you get out of using all sorts of efficiencies of getting out of, of things that are actually made, as you say, in, in the factory, made off-site, um, the contractor who got the job elected to do it in the end precast. And we're doing it all precast, which of course is fabulous. And I think this is, um, well, from my point of view as, 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 as an engineer and somebody who's interested in actually how things are made and how things are put together and accuracy of things, you know, then the more that is made off-site, the less you keep. I mean, I 
construction sites are awful. You can't make them efficient beyond a certain point because um, so many factors come into being into play that are outside one's control, outside the contractor's control, engineer's control, whatever. And I, yes, I mean, now, oh, yes, just sorry, talking about monocoque structures, we are actually doing one at the moment. No, 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 this is something else. No, we're, I mean, it, we're doing a series of very big, well, it may change, actually, but we're working on Blackfriars Station with Will also. And it's quite a problem, actually, because we, we have, we're building a new roof canopy, as it were. It's about 30 metres wide and about... 350 metres long or something, 300 metres long. But we can only take supports down at about 60 metre centres because that's where the existing piers are. I mean, there might be other ways of doing it, actually. But. And that, so that, those main support girders, call them that, it's a column and beam, actually, they're, they're curved, they're doubly curved shapes. They're rather, they're super, they're sort of torpedo things, you know, they're typical will also, actually. And they are actually monocoques because we have this relatively lightweight steel framework inside, which is actually metal sheet clad properly, so that they are working together. So it takes the bending, takes the torsion, everything and the shears as a combination. And that, yes, I think that's one of the few examples. Finally, enough, the bridge I referred to earlier is also with all sops. See, there are some people who are prepared to push that technology, whatever you like to call it. Yes, are you, you're talking about the timber grid shell. Yeah. Yes, I apologize, I should have put that in. You're quite right. Yes, actually I don't know where my slides of that are. Yes, I do, but I don't have any illustration. Are they the ones that uh, sort of come as a bundle and you open them out? Yeah, the whole thing falls out. That, that guy's a genius. Yes, yes, I, I do know about those, in fact. But I don't have any slides of them, and I don't know where to get them. Are there any here in the AA library, do you know? There might be. I don't know anybody much who knows. Yeah, he's very under underpublished, actually. That's right, I know. Um, well, there's always something missing. You know. I, you've got a very good point, though, about the Mannheim thing, because that, again, you know, wouldn't have worked unless it had its double curvature uh, and was magic in a way in the sense that you set the whole thing up with these joints that rate can rotate. You've got to get the geometry absolutely right so that when you push the thing up and you fix it against the boundary, you get the shape you actually wanted in the first place. You ought to have Ian Little talking about that, actually, because he was very involved with that. Because um, he, in the end, act, uh, acted as structural designer for that man, I think. Um, he took it over from somebody else, some German engineer, I think, who sort of got it wrong, I seem to remember. But he's fascinating about it. So, yes, that's a wonderful structure. Yeah. No, it's jolly nice to have had some questions, actually. I must say, I like that. It's, um, right, that's it. Well, that's all right. It's okay. Thanks so much. I just... That's it. Go on. Thank you. I won't say anything. Now, I was going to make a comparison between this school and another one where I lectured earlier in the week, but I thought that would probably be a bit unfair <laughs> in terms of numbers who turned out. Um. <coughs> Sorry, I should, I should make a little announcement as well that next, next week um, the lecture has been cancelled. Um, so there won't, there won't be a lecture next Thursday. That was uh, Andy Ford and Ted Kalman. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks okay. All right. Which might be going out. Touching the other side, it's a double shell.